Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now I'm looking back through my upload history and I'm honestly very surprised we've never spoken of this. This is the 8800 GTX and if you owned one of these in 2006, well let's just say you'd have a pretty decent time when it came to running games. Today I want to take a look back at this legend, explain why I think it's one of the most influential and best graphics card releases of all time and see what it can do in a few modern-ish titles despite its age. So without further ado let's get into it, take a trip down memory lane and explore the power and the overall beastiness of this once legendary GPU from Team Green. So the 8800 GTX launched in November of 2006 and was the first to primarily implement Microsoft's new API, DirectX 10, along with the cheaper and weaker 8800 GTS, which we've taken a look at in the past. With a launch price of $600, US it cost the same as the company's previous generation flagship, the 7900 GTX, though the 8800 was such a beast back in the day that some review sites even concluded that a single one of these was as powerful, if not more so, than two aforementioned 7900s in SLI. A card like this meant that even the most demanding games out there would run maxed out with resolutions up to and including 2560 by 1600 This power came at a cost though, and I'm not just talking price. While it's not uncommon today to see two or maybe in some instances three 6-pin connectors atop a graphics card, back then the presence of two 75-watt connectors would have certainly been a new sight to some, demonstrating just how thirsty this 155-watt TDP card was. Aesthetically speaking, this card is also very long, with this particular model having been pulled from an old-school Dell XPS 420 gaming system likely meaning it spent most of its life paired with a Core 2 Quad. Before we check out the performance, let's look under the hood, so to speak. Removing the massive heatsink reveals the huge G80 graphics chip, and also gives us an opportunity to remove any dust from the board, and reapply a fresh coat of thermal paste. Essential maintenance for any second-hand PC component. Specs-wise, this 8800 GTX features 768MB of GDDR3 VRAM, a 576MHz clock speed, and a 900MHz memory clock. These specifications meant that for the next year, it would remain among the top performers, eventually dropping to $400 before being discontinued. These days you can pick them up fairly cheap, and I happily paid £20 for this piece of hardware history. So now, we must see how it performs, and to do this I jumped into a few of my favourite last generation titles. So, during today's gameplay results, as you may have noticed, I've included the frame time under the usual FPS counter in the top left corner. Now basically, this frame time relates to those 1% and 0.1% lows, as I still get quite a few questions regarding what they mean. Basically, the more consistent the frame time number, the more consistent the frame rate. The more variation we see on that frame time number, well, the more stutter you're going to experience in-game basically, and that reflects what the 1% and 0.1% figures come back as. In today's test I started off with Battlefield 3 at 900p and had to turn everything down to the low settings to achieve a pretty stable 51 frames per second on average with decent enough 1% and 0.1% lows that meant we really didn't see that much stutter at all. It was a similar story in Bioshock Infinite, although we were able to turn the resolution here back up to 1080p, though I had to keep the settings at their lowest. After playing through this level in its entirety, the average recorded frame rate was 43 FPS. This was followed by a 1% low of 31 and a 0.1% low of 26, meaning that throughout my gameplay today with this game I saw no real stutter. There were a couple of drops here and there, but nothing that hindered the overall gameplay experience of this title, and I could happily play Bioshock Infinite from start to finish on a system that featured the now 12 year old 8800 GTX GPU. Next up I jumped into the original Call of Duty Black Ops, one of the best in the series in my opinion. Again we were able to leave things at 1080p Full HD 
and I was even able to turn the settings up to normal here to achieve a pretty close to 60 frames per second average. The 1% lows of 42 and the 0.1% low of 33 again indicate that there really wasn't much stutter. So far so good and I was seeing a lot less hiccups than I was expecting to with this old 768 megabyte card. Now we all know how demanding the original 2007 crisis can be, so in today's video I decided to check out its successor Crisis 2. At 900p we were able to run the game with the high settings with an average of 46 frames per second. Now while high settings does sound quite good, the lowest settings in this game is actually the high preset, I believe it goes high, very high, uh, extreme and then ultra, so if you do select high just know that it does mean that you are selecting the lowest in-game preset from the list of options in this title. 46 frames per second however was pretty respectable for this ancient GPU, although you will see some stutter here and there as indicated by those 1% and 0.1% figures. But how could I test the sequel without testing out the original as well? So here it is, the original Crisis. This actually ran very similar to its successor, um, with around 45 frames per second, although in the original Crisis I was able to turn things up to 1080p with the medium preset. So we are running at a higher resolution than I ran Crisis 2 at. And for the 8800 GTX, well, it seems to be a pretty easy task, though don't expect 60 frames per second unless you're willing to turn things down to low, or you want to drop the resolution to say 900 or even 720p, as the action does heat up in this game uh, in different areas. Some areas are relatively quiet, and some you will see a bit more action going on, so it's advisable to adjust your settings to account for uh, what you see on screen. Though sticking to 1080p medium throughout should be a decent enough option for most of you on a card like this. Now while we're on the theme of jungles and open worlds, I decided to play Far Cry 2 once again at 1080p Full HD. Here I left things on the medium preset and ran the game in DirectX 9 mode. That's an important distinction because you can play this in either DX9 or DX10, though DX10 will of course take a bit more of a toll on your system, so to maximise performance I switched everything over to DX9 and we were able to achieve at least 60 frames per second on average, which I feel is a very respectable result. Far Cry 2 is one of those classics that once you start playing it, you really can't put it down and it's an ideal title to run on this card, so definitely check it out if you have an older card and aren't sure if you can run it. Of course, a relatively modern title that also runs on DirectX 10 is Grand Theft Auto 5. Although I did have to turn things down to 720p, we were able to achieve an average frame rate of 47 FPS, which was actually quite surprising considering the hardware and considering that we only had 768 megabytes of VRAM to play with. Even on the lowest settings or the normal in-game settings according to GTA, we did exceed that VRAM limit, so we couldn't really turn things up higher than normal, although I expect you could turn things up a little more and still achieve closer to 30 frames per second at 720p, but I found that keeping everything on low here was definitely the best way to go. The original version of the Elder Scrolls Skyrim also ran very well. Now this wasn't the remastered version, this is the original version of the game that came out a few years ago, and with the medium settings, anti-aliasing off and 1080p Full HD resolution, we were able to see at least 50 frames per second, with pretty respectable frame times as well as you can see by the results. Now, I tried a couple of other slightly uh, more demanding or modern, shall we say, titles, the first of which was Fortnite, but unfortunately I couldn't make it past this error screen here. I really thought the game was going to fire up, but unfortunately it just crashed to the desktop after this message. Um, CSGO as well, another popular title that you're always asking me to check out, just simply displayed a black screen before jamming the whole system and forcing me to sign out of Windows, so that wasn't exactly a brilliant result either. So there we have it, one of the most popular graphics cards of all time and one of my personal favourites, the 8800 GTX. Now Nvidia did release another 800 series card, the 8800 Ultra, 
but it retailed for between $800 and $1,000, and its popularity was nowhere near the previous GTX, with many thinking it was too expensive, considering the performance gains were only about 10% over the standard GTX. So that car never really went down as well, although these days it can be found at a relatively cheaper price also. As for this video though and this card, I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like on it down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, as always, I'll see you in the next one.